Hello, everyone. Uh, it is 1 o'clock Pacific time on Thursday, which means that it is time for Game Pass Plays, our weekly show where we hang out with members of the engineering team here and play some great games in Game Pass. More excitingly, it also is Age of Empires 4 release day. Um, you see kind of on our banner in the bottom left here. Uh, if you didn't know, Game Pass has PC games. We've had great PC games for quite some time, and I don't uh, mean to downplay how many great games have come out on PC in the past, but I have to say personally, this is one of the most exciting uh, day and date relaunches for me in a long time here. Uh, and I'm excited to be joined today uh, with some of the folks from the development team that worked on bringing Age of Empires 4 to life. So. My name is Nick. I am one of the regular hosts here. I work on the Game Pass engineering team as well as Xbox experiences as a whole. Joined today by three members of the Relic Entertainment team uh, who have been working on Age of Empires 4. Uh, if you guys could introduce yourselves. Yeah, uh, my name is Elliot Hong and I am the senior community manager for uh, Age of Empires on the Relic Entertainment side. And uh, my name is Quinn Duffy. I'm the game director on Age of Empires 4 here at uh, Relic. Uh, I've been on the project from the beginning, sort of from the, the first discussions with Microsoft uh, all the way up to today. So it's super exciting, super exciting to be here. Hi, I'm Lauren Wood. I'm a principal narrative designer at Relic. I've been working on Age 4 for about three and a half years now. I do a lot of the historical research and writing and taking care of videos and things like that. Great to be here. Thank you all for being here. Uh, so excited to get a chance to learn a little bit more about the game from you and uh, show some of this off to folks who maybe haven't had a chance to try it yet. If you are all watching right now uh, and if you're in Game Pass, uh, this is available for you to go grab right now so you can play along with us. Um, if you are not yet, I believe that we will uh, frequently do some giveaways in chat for a chance to get some some Game Pass Ultimate time, um, or this is also available for you to, of course, purchase um, in, in the place that you see fit. Uh, I would love to start before we jump into the game here a little bit. Uh, Quinn, you mentioned you've been here since the beginning. What is the beginning? Uh, how long have you guys been working on this now? <laughs> oh, God. I don't know if I, <laughs> if I should say. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, it's been a it's been a long time. We we, we started discussions with with Microsoft. Um, I'm gonna say summer of like you know 2016. So it's uh, it has been a uh, a long road and and uh, um, a really interesting journey, you know, to to get to today. Um, and you know, they, I mean, Microsoft and World's Edge have been have been great partners uh, and. You know, the, the, it's been a very strange development in a lot of ways. Uh, I, I, I know a lot of people are probably feeling the same, but we've spent the last you know couple of years working from home, uh, and uh, and you know this definitely added some challenges and some some wrinkles to uh, uh, to the whole process. So I'm just I'm, I'm uh, delighted, uh, you know, at the, at the response and uh, honored with the the uh, the sort of the excitement we've seen about uh, the game so far on on all the platforms super exciting today i've seen i've seen some of the initial feedback that you see from press and what which has of course been great but uh, i had i had the privilege uh preparing for the stream of getting to to get a build of the game a little early and get get into this and personally i'm just stunned by what you guys have built here so hope you that hope that 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 journey since 2016 has been worthwhile and you feel really great about what you guys have put out here um Folks in the chat, if you have questions for any of our any of our guests here, uh, feel free to put those in chat. We'll relay those along. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about what you them do in more detail in a little bit here. But want to start jumping into the game here, uh, so you can start getting a sense of things. Uh, we'll be showing off some of the campaign today, and in particular, uh, once you get past some of the initial tutorial missions and uh, the initial campaign bits, things open up a little bit. There's a few campaigns for you to try. We are going to be diving into the fourth mission. Uh, in this Mongol Empire campaign here. Um, and I will admit, I'm not actually sure this was recommended by folks uh, over at Relic as a good one to show off on stream. I'm not exactly sure why. Uh, Lauren, did you have a thought as to why this was <laughs> this was one we wanted to show off in particular? Oh, this one is a doozy. Um, it's the raising of an entire city. And I think the campaign guys were excited to show everyone some of the Mongol specialities that make this mission exciting, so keen to get into that. 
Awesome. And we'll get back to some of the questions in a little bit here, but uh, as Alibi Lenart mentions, uh, the videos and the introductions to these campaign scenes have been really just stunning if you haven't seen any yet. So I want to make sure we leave space so people can enjoy that as we jump in. Um, and I, this one I haven't gotten to see myself yet either. So I'm going to go ahead and hit start on here. Wait, whoa, difficulty level. Oh, difficulty level. That is a good question. Um, I have- Go to settings. Setting. Yeah. I have this set right now to easy, I believe. Yes. Yeah. And I noticed I was choosing this um, as I was getting up to this point over the last couple of days. Um, there's a couple different difficulties levels here, and I remember it saying that, uh, you know, age is meant to be played or it's balanced for intermediate. Uh, but there's these other modes here that uh, make this a little bit more approachable. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about easy and story and how people should think about a good difficulty for themselves? Yeah, I think, uh, I think, uh, oh, sorry, Lauren. Yeah, I mean, if you are new to the experience um, and, you know, we anticipate a lot of people coming to Game Pass might be trying uh, a real-time strategy game possibly for the first time or possibly for the first time in a long time. Uh, and if you know, if you want to get through the campaign and view uh, the narrative, the history, the documentaries, the, the unlocks, and you want to do it with, with just the minimal level of challenge, you can play the story mode uh, and, and you'll, get, you'll get the full sort of narrative experience of playing through the game uh, without you know, any sort of significant pressure. So it gives you a chance to play through at your own pace and, and, and just enjoy unlocking the, you know, all the elements of the campaign. Uh, and then, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, there's the the hardest, which is pretty hard. Like I, you know, I've I have completed every mission except one on hard, uh, and I won't say which one. Um, but they, you know, it's 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 tough even for for pretty seasoned players. So, you know, you, you, there's a there's a, a a good continuum of difficulty there. And uh, and the nice thing is, you know, you can go back and change it if you want to try a mission on a on a different difficulty level and. Uh, to find the right level of challenge for your playstyle. My thought here is for this stream, easy is maybe a good balance of, there'll be a little bit of pressure here, but I won't embarrass myself on stream. Um, I guess we'll find out. <laughs> but I guess, you know, we, we, we will see. Uh, story mode is one of those things that I kind of wondered, uh, even when I was playing this myself, hey, you know, it's primarily a game about the actual RTS. What is, you know, why is there a story mode? Why would I want to turn all this stuff off? And as you'll all see in just a moment here, the amount of work that's gone into the narrative and, and in the presentation is really, really impressively staggering. And, and you'll see really quickly why somebody might want to be able to go through that way. So um, let's jump in there and then we'll get to some of the questions that people have. On June the 1st, 1215, the city of Chengdu, known today as Beijing, fell to the Mongols. They looted the city, sending caravans loaded with luxuries back home. This, this part of the video connects the to the previous to mission that you Genghis will have just Khan's finished, and then triumphs. takes you into the Siege of Kiev. After his death in 1227, his descendants continued the conquests, and his grandson, Batu Khan, had his eyes on the west. The Mongol raids of the 1220s had shown that the Rus lands held riches worth exploiting. The battles had devastated the Rus elite, and their defenses were weak. So Batu Khan organized an enormous invasion force, determined to turn the Rus lands into vassals of the Mongol Empire. The Mongols captured territory after territory. By 1240, they had their sights on the great city of Kiev. Kiev was a jewel among the Rus principalities, a center of scholarship, power, and wealth. Batu Khan's cousin Monka was put in command of the advance force, ready to attack. Chroniclers tell of Monka's admiration for the beauty of Kiev, so he was reluctant to destroy it. Monka sent his envoys to the city 
to demand its surrender. But Kiev's commander in charge refused and killed the Mongol envoys. Monka would not stand for such disrespect. His army rode to the city walls and prepared to attack. They would show Kiev no mercy. This video style of the real world video with the kind of graphical overlay is so stunning. Um, are these all videos that were shot specifically for this campaign or how did how did these get put together? Yeah, the uh, the videos are shot by this fantastic production company in London called Lion TV and 99% of the footage that you see was shot exclusively for age four. Um, there's a little bit of stock in there in locations where they weren't allowed to shoot, but the rest of it is all made for this game. And those uh, shots you're talking about where you see those golden soldiers overlaid on top of the modern day footage is some of the really great moments in those films where you feel like, oh, there's a connection here between the past and the present, um, which echoes sort of throughout the game. You'll sit here on the loading screens and the gameplay as well. Yeah, a couple other questions around that coming in from chat before we jump into the game here. Um... Ninty Gold asking, did the developers visit the areas this is all based on as part of the design process? Some some areas we certainly did, yeah, yeah. The areas that that we could get to in the time we had. Um, I think most most particular, uh, we took a trip, uh, well, a couple of trips uh, to uh, southern England and uh, one to northern France to look at the mm -hmm. um, the Hundred Years' War campaign and the Norman campaigns, uh, sort of location s scouting, I guess. You know, I mean, we treated them a little bit like like a like a film. We wanted to see what places looked good to us uh and and what kind of um stories emerged through our research and and visiting these locations what the ground was a little bit like you know we had our art director and and uh uh you know and i, and I went uh, um you know along with some others just to, to get a feel of of uh where we wanted to shoot uh and uh sort of how we wanted to tell some of the some of the stories so you know lauren touched on it that past and present was a strong thread in the in the vision of the game that you know connecting history uh to the modern day and and places that have survived you know from 800 years ago to today uh give us a really cool thread you know, to kind of weave a, a narrative around uh and and um and, and and that's sort of the the reason we've we've done some of these videos and and the golden overlays is just again to bring people from past to present. Uh, and it, it's super cool. I, lo I just I love the way it's turned out. It really does look great. Simmer yeah. Chef also. Asked I also anything. want to mention oh. as well. Um, like it wasn't just for research. Like we went to like Mongolia for example to do all the voice capture. Like we were in Mongolia, and we had our sound designer there working with Mongolian voice actors to capture all the voice lines you hear in game. So. There was a lot of work that was done to like really capture the global feel of what this history is about. So, and you mentioned history. And music. Um, Simmer Chef was asking, "Is yeah, this a well. is this a true event? Is this a true story? We just watched the little brief for." Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is all yep. based in real events. Um, some of it we have Monkey like taken the gist of an the event West, and, and the put it in here, and some is like compressed events from the a long period of time that are in one mission. But but some is a bit more closer to, to you know surrender, the events that they have. Only one as if Mana Race are here to take the city. So force. all generally real events, kind of to catch people up on this campaign so far. Uh, the last couple missions you spend. Uh, the Mongols uh, working on their eastern front and battling against uh, some of the Qin dynasty um, in China and now kind of turning their, their sights westward against Kiev and the Rus, which um, I'm not familiar with that term. Is that a uh, historically accurate term back from this time or where does that come from? Yeah, they were they were the, the, the people that lived in um the area that would now be uh, Ukraine, you know, Belarus, uh, Russia, um, you know, the sort of the the, the, the sort of Slavic peoples, and uh, and so that's their that's the sort of lineage of a lot of the the uh, countries of that that part of Eastern Europe. So, uh, for those who have not seen this before, real-time strategy game, um, obviously it's. A lot of it does have to do with 
combat, although as we'll get into in a little bit here, I imagine, um, it's also as much a game about resources and production as it is uh, about combat. Uh, but this little in intro bit here, uh, generally the game has been really good in the campaign of putting uh, a series of goals on the top left that kind of move the story along. In this case, we're, case, we're trying to get our way past this gate here. Um, and just kind of looking at what they've left us with here, we have a couple siege weapons, um, this battering ram, which I think is new to the series, and then uh, troops can obviously uh, also do damage to walls, but not nearly as effectively. So I'm assuming uh, that we're meant to go and just bust down this wall first and defend our siege weapons against the inevitable counterattack here. So um, definitely defending those trebuchets will be important for you later. <laughs> yes, they they always come in handy. Yeah. So one thing that I spend a lot of time. Uh, doing, and I don't know if I do this in the right way or not, uh, or the most effective way, but um, if you haven't played an age game before, um, they have a really elegant system of assigning squads together. You can hold control and hit a number, and it, it creates a squad out of a selected bunch of units. Um, and units can be parts of multiple squads as well, but it lets you really quickly say, hey, you know, group one is going to be my siege weapons, let's move those together. Um, and maybe my... my Horse-mounted um, troops will be in group two, and my foot troops will be in group three. Um, so I don't know if you guys have recommendations for how to think about that. I generally do separate that way, kind of by speed, and I'm not sure if that's a good way to think about things or if there's a better way. I think it's it's totally up to you. Like I I actually tend to uh, hotkey my buildings so I can quickly <laughs> I can quickly get to production centers that I want to jump to. Uh, more than more than I tend to hotkey units because I'm I'm uh, not as fast as I used to be, so it's uh, for me it's about like okay I need a production efficiency so all my barracks I put on a number all my archery ranges I put on a number just to be able to oh, hey. shout a bunch of units. Right, well that's a thing. Protect the siege engines. <laughs> yeah, I tend to group. Um, I group like m mixed groups of units, so I can kind of send them off to like different gates to defend my town and know that I've got a mixture of units at each end. And one of the clever I things... I don't know if that's the best strategy or not. Well, so you mentioned mixed groups. One of the clever things that I've noticed about this is if you group units of different speed, they will move as a group, even though, you know, ones that are on horseback could obviously move faster than the others. They will know that they're part of a group and move together. Um, so, it's smart in that way. Um, unsurprisingly, stuff uh, defending against us right now. Um, now. The formations are a great way to sort of organize uh, your units. And, uh, you know, you can use those in game uh, tactically. You, you spread your units out so you don't get a lot of uh, damage from siege weapons. Or you can use the line to you know, block a choke point, uh, force the enemy to engage with your troops. So. I have not, I will admit, spent a lot of time thinking about how the formations can help or not. Um, and I also did not know that you could hotkey um, buildings. So that tells you a little bit about the expertise level here. I expect to learn a lot during this during this stream. Now, there's a lot of other ways to access buildings. They have they have various shortcut keys and stuff. But uh, you know, if you're in a in a rush, like I often am, I, I just use the hotkeys. The Mongol army broke through the gates of Kiev and marched on the city. Monka Khan called on his people to bring in their mobile camp while his forces secured a location for it. So you can hear the narrator talking about a mobile camp. One of the things that is uh, really interesting about the game here is that as opposed to every civilization just being a reskin or different the voices, area beyond Kiev's um, main they actually play quite a bit differently. Um, but rich in and one of the things that is beyond unique to the Mongol civilization here district. is that all of your Out buildings that are associated with your town, they can district. basically pack the up and move. Um, so you can set up a camp, Kiev, build units, gather resources, the and then as the rush. front moves, you can pick up your camp and move them as opposed to having to build new cities, which um, I found to be both really useful in terms of uh, you know being able to keep advancing the front, but also almost a little stressful in terms of the extra buildings and the extra work that need to be managed. Yeah, that's. I think yeah, I was. I, mean, I was, was going to say with the Mongol that, uh, armies. Purpose, yeah. 
Yeah. Hey, and with the Mongol army specifically, uh, it's great, you're right about the mobility, but actually when they're on the move, they're actually really susceptible to getting raided or destroyed because they lose their building armor while they're being transported around. So it's not just like you can just do that and just go across the map without any fear. There has to be a bit of like strategic, like strategic timing to make sure that you uh, mm -hmm. don't lose your buildings because those are costly and also take time to read the so the other thing that's really interesting about the Mongols here is this, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, is an Ovu? Ovu, yeah. Ovu, um, which seems to be key to the civilization also. It builds on top of these stone units, and then uh, buildings that are built in this little halo around this uh, get benefits. Um, what is that? What is that? I assume that that has some historical bearing. What is that kind of well, the Ovu to? is, I, I believe it's um, a type of shrine and uh, travelers will pass an add stone to it, all the little colorful flags that you see on the um, on the design of the Ogu there, um, as a sort of good luck, you know. Um, I don't know too much about the history of it, but that's where, where it came here. from. So when you make your Ogu there on the stone deposit, it automatically generates the stone for you. So the Mongols don't mine stone in the same way that the other civilizations do. They put down the Ogus and they get the stone as it comes to them. But what you can do is build your production buildings within the influence area. You can see the little plus that appears when the building is in the influence of the Ovu. And you then get access to produce double units um, using the stone. You can see there um, at the bottom of your uh, barracks UI there, you've got the two times spearmen and yeah. So you can pump out units much faster. But it uses stone pretty quickly when you do that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to go ahead and just start doing a couple of things I'm used to doing. You can tell me if this is a good way to think about things. But I, I tend to, to hunker down and start getting resource production before I even think about advancing militarily here. So usually putting down these gurs are uh, buildings where you can have your units drop off resources they're collecting, whether that be wood or berries or animals um, or gold. Um, you can chop down trees for wood is one resource here. Uh, I mentioned this is as much of a resource game as a battle game. Um, going to build some pastures here to, or, um, to give us a food supply, although I noticed there's some berries here we can work with as well. Um, and then noticing there's gold here that we can start mining as well. So a bunch of economic stuff to do first, it feels like here. There's a, there's a bunch of different kinds of, of food resources that are available too for, you know, the, the resources are a bit abstracted, but they're, you know, for, for players new to RTS, those are the things you need to advance your technology and to build units. So things like food, wood, gold, and, and stone are used uh, to, to build military and economic units like your villagers here who do all the work. And, uh, uh, gold is a way that you improve the power of your army through upgrades and uh, progressively more powerful units. And, and the for, resources for themselves. moving up through the ages, which is you know where the the game kind of draws its its name from. So you just took out some uh, some traders there, and and uh, you see they've dropped some chests, which would contain resources, food or gold or something like that that you could take to add to your economy and and uh, help you build up your army uh, uh, to be even larger and more powerful. I saw them walking by, I did not realize that there was stuff to collect. Oh boy, mm -hmm. someone's shooting at me. In Let's some mission, taking out the enemy... Tra Sorry, in some missions, taking out the enemy traders also weaken the enemy response. When you, um, when you go into the city, it kind of like... doesn't allow them to produce as many units. Um, so it's a good thing to do. Fun thing that's new to this one, I think, that I don't remember from past games in the series, you can kind of see how many villagers you have assigned to collect each sort of resource on the bottom here, so you can get a sense of whether you have the balance that you want. Um, it's handy to, to see that at a, uh, at a glance. Uh, and actually, those, those pastures, if you want, you can also set a rally point from those. So if you click that, and then you can, you can right-click, that'll... So now when your sheep spawn, they'll move to a location and... You can pile them all up in a certain area and have your villagers gather from them if if you don't find the layout to be as efficient as you'd like. That's true for the, little, the military buildings tips. too, right? So true for the military buildings as well. For, for where our units pop out. Um, so now that we've got at least some basic collection going on, we can start thinking about uh, building up our army. I tend to be the sort, and I'd love to hear, uh, you guys have been playing this for a lot longer, I tend to be the sort of the, hey, I've got to build an enormous army before I go do anything because... <laughs> Um, you know, you don't want to risk getting outmatched and losing everyone. 
What's your isn't that the way that everyone plays RTS? Like, isn't isn't that the bread and butter way to play RTS games? I, I think the really good players know <laughs> when you've got enough, yeah. right? You just need enough. And I don't think I've ever hit that yeah. balance well, right? Is this enough for me to work with, which which I've been given in the beginning here? Or are these campaigns kind of built for me to need to do some more building before before I can move forward? I think that's where something like scouting comes in, right? So you get a you get a view of of the map. Uh, of the objectives that you're trying to tackle, and you might get a sense of the strength of the army you're going to need. Uh, well, you know, once you've played a little bit and you've had some experience with the campaign and with the the uh, the enemy you're fighting. So your scout there uh, is that him in the middle? Um, yeah, you can sort of send him out to kind of take a look at what's what's around you, find new resources, uh, find find the enemy objectives, and and uh, then you can start building your army up to tackle the, the next uh, level of objectives. Makes sense. And and you think about scouting also in terms of knowing um, what you should build. There is a little bit of a rock, paper, scissors element to the units in this game, right? Kind of built intentionally. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to describe that a little bit. By I understand, I, I may get this wrong a little bit, but... Um, Kind of the mounted units that are fast are good against archers because they can catch up to them before they do too much damage. Um, the archers are really good against the slow moving, more heavily uh, armored foot soldiers. And then, uh, what's the one? Oh, and the, the foot soldiers there. are good, right? The spears are good against the mounted units. And so you kind of get that triangle of wanting to have the right units to battle um, whatever the enemy has. Yeah, and then you got some little sort of subtle uh, derivations in there, like crossbowmen are good at countering heavy armor uh, with the, the power of the crossbow. Uh, and then you have your sort of added arms or, or heavy infantry that can just kind of soak up damage. Uh, and, and they're your, sort of your, your tanks, you know, out in the battlefield. The Mongols long. also have the the con too. You, you know the, the various cons that you play with in the campaign have different special abilities that that they can perform as well. Uh, like, there's this leader with the crown on its head yeah. that has kind of special abilities. In this case, you can uh, fire a speed arrow that that increases reload speed. You can fire a maneuver arrow that uh, increases uh, movement speed. So an extra layer there as well. I am. Halfway trying to carry on the conversation and halfway trying to know, play the game, and I'm getting kind of picked at here. So let me go clear out some of these guys who are just kind of sniping at me here and give ourselves a little bit more space, and then we can start thinking. So about one thing you might notice too that when you destroy an enemy building, you'll see a bunch of resource uh, indicators kind of kind of fly up. That, that's the Mongol raid mechanic. They get they get money for destroying enemy structures. So it's another way to augment your economy uh, and encourages Mongol players to be a little more aggressive. The way you know, the way the Mongol armies would would raid the enemy and uh, be attacking all over the place, and destroying structures, and, and you know, staying as, as mobile as possible. Meanwhile, got some folks. Can I meet villagers? They're attacking. Always so. oh, not the villager. What am I talking about? What happened to all my villagers that were collecting gold? Uh oh. Whoops. Did they get all killed? I think they did. I think I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> Which is okay. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and so you're, see you're a bunch doing of well with food. You got lots of lots of food. And I feel like what's, there's a bunch of doing well. Probably time to age here, up. So yeah. I think it's time to age up here. This is gonna heal units. Let's go ahead and build a thing that heals units and start building some more military units here and see if we can stem some of the bleeding we're dealing with here. These towers are proving to be quite irritating. Yeah, uh, those are the sort of wooden wooden keeps and uh, can be upgraded in a couple of different ways as well to with even heavier firepower. And those are unique to the Rus, those wooden fortresses. They're equivalent of the outpost in, in other civilizations. Um, Good targets yeah, for your they're pretty meaty. Yeah. Oh yeah, I have siege weapons. How about that? <laughs> yeah. Easy to forget. Nice passive-aggressive hint I gave you there. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's, it's one of those kind of risk-reward things, right? Because I also don't want to throw yeah. them out there and get them 
get them beat up no. while I feel like I'm not on top of things quite yet. Yeah, siege weapons, like, they especially take a while to build and they're very resource intensive, so losing them, like, anytime you're fighting an opponent and there's, they have siege weapons, if you can high, high prioritize those and get those first, you're also doing a huge uh, drop off on enemy damage, right? So, it's uh, definitely, you know, risk reward thing is definitely. You guys had mentioned the, um, you mentioned the whole getting extra benefits from stone here. You can kind of see that here. You'll notice on the left here I have a choice to build horsemen, early lancers, or mungo die from this stable. I can also build them two at a time, but it costs extra stone on top of the regular costs here. So if I have stone I'm willing to spend on that, um, I can pump out units a lot faster here that way, um, which can be handy. Now that we've upgraded ages here, uh, a lot of other upgrades coming into play here, so I'm going to start pumping some of those upgrades out as well. Um, that's, uh, I think Quinn had mentioned that gold helps you improve your, your units that way. So let's go ahead and get those upgrades going. We've we'll probably have some new buildings too. That's right. What can we build here? If the, if the computer would just give me time to think. <laughs> uh, new buildings here. So an arsenal um, looks like that's a way to upgrade our horse units further. Uh, Siege engines uh, come out of this, so I assume I can build more trebuchets and whatnot if I build one of those. And I'm not familiar with this prayer tent. That's where you're going to produce your your shaman. Um, I think it, they're a healer, uh, and you can also capture uh, relics from around the map. I don't know if all of the campaign maps have relics, but uh, certainly in in skirmish, there you can bring them back to your. Uh, your prayer tent or your uh, monastery will help generate gold. You can also use them uh, to convert enemy units uh, in uh, in H4. Uh, and we do area conversion, which can be a really interesting uh, game swinging event if you can uh, capture a bunch of a bunch of enemy units all of a sudden. So this is one of those cases where. Uh the fact that you can pick up and move your buildings as the Mongols is useful. I'm realizing, hey, I didn't leave space around my, mm -hmm. my Uvu to place an archery range, mm -hmm. but I can just put one down somewhere and later I can rearrange. Eventually this stone deposit will run out of stone also and I'm going to end up moving anyway. So I think I'm going to start by getting an, an archery range, which I didn't realize I didn't have one of. Um, and then any recommendations on some of these other buildings that I should be focusing on? Well, ultimately we'll you'll, you'll need that siege workshop at some point. Get some mm -hmm. yep. mangonel for when you go on into the city. Yeah, and your blacksmith in age two will help you in improve your armor and um, attack on uh, a lot of your infantry and cavalry units. So that's, that'll make your units uh, more durable and, and uh, certainly more deadlier. So starting to regenerate some of those units I've been losing. We'll keep building some more stuff in general here. Uh, eventually, as we said, if I had time to scout, I would know more of what I should build, but barring that, I'll get more variety. I think they started me with a couple scouts, and I honestly cannot remember where they went. Is there a good way to just find my scouts? I think there's, a, there's a shortcut. I think it's a, like the slash or the backslash. You will find your scouts. They may have... Um, they may, have they may, may be dead. That, they that may not dead. be there anymore. How about we make a couple scouts? Yeah. It might be a good time to scout around where those target markers are on the minimap yeah. to see what you're up against in a little bit. We will go ahead and do that as soon as I have some scouts to work with again. Uh, they're building right now. <laughs> enemy in your wood line. It's enemy in your wood line. Oh, that's why I keep running oh, out of villagers. Here they come. Watch the trips. I just assumed that the right side was safe, and I was not right. I think in this time period, you were never safe. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I think this gives us a couple things that we need to think about doing here. Uh, we should build some defenses on the right side here. Um, I know that you mentioned those towers were unique to the roost, but we do have a variant of those I've noticed you can build. We can make our own watchtowers that can fire arrows and things. So we'll put a little defenses on the right side here. Well, I think they came from the south, those those attackers, not they? From, Oh, that makes uh, sense. Yeah, mm -hmm. yep. just before you <laughs> okay. put your tower in the wrong place. <laughs> let's, let's send these scouts down to see what's going on down here. Mm -hmm. Built some outposts down here to start. Oh, okay, that's not that. Yeah, it's like, whoops. Uh, the the nice things about the outposts, too, is that they can... The, the Mongols had this thing called a yam network, uh, 
which you can learn about in the in some of the, the hands-on history videos. Uh, but basically, it's the the equivalent of the early equivalent of uh, I guess the Pony Express might be kind of familiar to people. They used fast riders and and runners to carry messages across the their massive empire. And the the our towers the the, the Ortus here provide speed bonuses for your units and kind of simulate the idea of the Yam network uh, and being able to move quickly around your your uh, your empire. They're, they've got extra benefit. They can see uh, and they can help improve the speed of your units nearby. The drops. Those are the those are the kind of things that you know when you when you we look at the history and the research that we were doing on the game and talking to our subject matter experts. Uh, those are the kind of things where you 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 can kind of take that history and turn them into a game mechanic that players can can utilize and and then we have the kind of historical context for them and the also the benefit as a gameplay mechanic and that's a, that's a ton of fun as, as a developer as a designer figure out how you take history and turn from it and turn it into something that's fun to play in the game how much do you guys uh build from the direction of here's what we need to make things feel balanced and how much do you build from the direction of here's something that feels historically accurate and we need to find a way to represent well, that's that's a really good question, and I think that's that's a, uh, I mean, it, there's there's some balance to be found there. Ultimately, we're we're making a game, and we want it to be balanced and fair. Um, but we use history as a as a development tool to help us kind of uh, find the unique elements of of the different civilizations, uh, and find the elements of history that we want to that we want to tell. For instance, in the in the campaign, but they definitely inform each other. But, Ultimately, you know, uh, the game has to work, and, and we need to make the game uh, fun and fair for, for all the players. Yeah, finding bits in the history and putting them into the game has been quite a, a gratifying experience. We've actually had some of the videos for this game in the can for two or three years, so there's been a bit of an opportunity for that historical research to actually make it into the game. Um, in some of the videos, for example, the a video about crossbowmen and how they use this huge deal called the Pavis and they made the film about it and we looked at it and said oh that's really cool maybe that should be a thing that crossbowmen can have in the uh, in the French civilization and there's a few other examples like that um, so it's yeah it's been a little bit both ways <clears throat> This is one of the fun tensions about the Mongols here right now. You noticed a little earlier I didn't call it out, but I ran out of stone where my Uvu currently is, and there's a new stone deposit up here. So I'm building all these defenses for where I'm at right now. How much do you invest in that, and how much do you recognize that you're going to move on pretty soon here and not want to go too deep there? And I don't have a good sense of that yet, um, but I realize that I'm building towers now that, you know, this one that's down to the south here, probably going to keep being useful because we want to keep people from coming that direction. But uh, some of these other ones, like this one I'm building in the middle here, this may not be useful for much longer um, as I pack up my camp and move to the west. So... Now, that's the nice thing about the Mongols. In a, in a traditional sieve, you know, if you wanted to create an expansion and move forward, you know, you may ha might have to forward build a bunch of buildings, um, more more barracks, more archery ranges, or whatever. But with the Mongols, you know, you just pick them up and and move them, and you've got a ready-made uh, a ready-made base. But the, the the you know that's the challenge with the Mongols is that they rely on that stone, and so there's you know there's an idea that. The opposition knows where you might end up going. You, know, you don't. You don't always have to use the stone, but uh, definitely put some. Uh, you know, the the players who are aware of the map will understand that you're you're probably aiming for stone at some point. So we're coming off like close to some enemies here. We got to clear out before we really set up camp here. Besides this new stone deposit, but I think that that's what we're going to do. So you'll notice I packed up my buildings and I'm get ready to get set up over here clear out some space for us here. Hopefully there's enough of an army here to take care of things. One of the things I'm spending a lot of time doing here, and I wonder if this is, is an issue, but I spend a lot of time just attack moving across the map and letting them use their judgment on what to take out, and I wonder how much micromanaging that makes a difference. You can be super efficient micromanaging. Like, like I mean, and that's, that's where some of that competitive skill skill comes from. Is how to micro your your units, how to 
how to attack and target, how to pick the right enemies to target. You know, going after the the ones that are damaged, rotating your your damaged units in and out of combat. Those are things that the competitive pro players can be really good at. And we wanted to ensure that there, you know there was still a skill there for them to kind of express their style and their and their personalities. Uh, you know, I was gonna say it's, it's something that you could definitely pick up and learn. Um, I, I started streaming with the Age of Empires team back in 2017, and it was a rude awakening of like how much of a skill difference there is once you do pick up on those skills. Um, obviously, with you know, as Quinn mentioned, there's so many different ways to play Age of Empires 4, but there's also a lot to master. The more you you know figure out the unit nuances and how to position, uh, it just opens up a whole other door of like strategy. Um, but you know, again, this game was made so that. You know, it'll fit any style of play that anybody wants to play for this game. Well, and as you can tell, right, I'm having trouble keeping track of everything going on as it is, let alone micromanaging. Oh, cow, that's not a thing a scout wants to do. That's a lot of units. Um, well, now I know what's happening down here. Uh, there's so much stuff to keep track of already. Uh, boy, thinking of micromanaging units on top of that just feels almost intractable. So I said I camp here. Uh, they've gotten, kind of gotten in behind me here, so... Alright, we'll heal some stuff up there. You're probably not in any significant danger, but that uh, southern camp is definitely a thorn in your side right now. Yeah, it's time to build up and kind of take that out, so... It's the, you know, some of the challenge too, as a, as a you know, when you're, when you're building your forces, like how much do you leave uh, to defend the areas that you've already captured? And how much do you feel you need to, uh, to attack and take the next objective? Um, because you are facing attacks, they're they're quite angry with you <laughs> for attacking Kiev. So. Oh, I don't forget too that the Khan has some abilities that you can trigger over and over um, to help you. There's some shielding in there and rapid reload and stuff. All right, so what do we do? Let's... <coughs> trebuchets. <coughs> trebuchets. Oh yeah. <laughs> Let's go, uh, let's go heal up a little bit here. What am I... not, not so subtle hint there. <laughs> <laughs> Where did my... Uh, what happened to my... Oh, this. We should put this down so that we can heal these units. And then let's go take care of the southern camp here, which, as, you're, as you so rightly pointed out, is quite a thorn in the side at the moment. We can just leave wood back here for now, that's fine. We've got our siege units. You got some damaged trebuchets, so villagers can actually also repair those. Uh, I did not actually Make sure that, so that's uh, that they're in top, tip top shape for the, the next phase. I did not know that, that's handy to know. It's handy when you're spending a bunch of money on a, on a trebuchet to to keep it alive. There's just so much stuff to keep track of. RTS games, it's like, you know, it's the equivalent of spinning, spinning plates, right? Like how, how long can you keep your plate, your your plate spinning, and how many plates can you, can you get spinning at once? Uh, and and I find like that's that's really the difference um, between a very sort of very competitive players is that they are able to keep just one or two more plates spinning, uh, you know, as you go deep into the game, and, and you know your your tech tree gets bigger, and the numbers of units you're controlling uh, increase. Uh, and and you know, I mean, people call it APM, whatever it is, but it's it, it's really just just being able to track and pay attention to everything that's happening all at once. I don't know if any of you are keeping an eye on. I'm recognizing the limits of how much stuff I can do at once. If any of you are able to keep an eye on chat for any questions, uh, I am not doing a great job of that right now, and I apologize to folks in chat uh, who may have have brought stuff up. All right, so we know we need to break through here. We know that there's a bunch of units that, that are going to want to take out our siege units. So let's do this in a safe and a smart way. Uh, now I noticed down there they have something called a springled, which is a, a another small siege weapon. Uh, 
it's kind of a counter counter siege weapon. It's it's the thing that will kill your trebuchets. Uh, so you need to be need to be careful with them. So this is probably a good time for me to be dealing with this other fight, huh? <laughs> Sometimes you just gotta leave some some things you gotta leave alone so they fight. They, oh, so yeah, they took out your trap. Now you can send your your fast cavalry to take out that springled. Uh, That's what that thing is. Or it wrecks see. everything else. Boy, that really did do a big whack of damage, didn't it? It, it basically like, you know, shoots like a six foot crossbow bolt. It's, <laughs> that would hurt. I'm assuming some people on the chat have seen the trebuchet videos that have been released in the last week. Did everybody see the one with the mountain lobbing various things out of a homemade trebuchet? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that, that, that was out yesterday. It is on the Xbox UK YouTube channel, which I will grab in the chat so you can check it out. Very cool video. Also pretty jealous that they got to go on site and uh, launch was... a bunch of stuff. Yeah. What's it? What's it? Hafnor? Half, Hafnor Thor Bjornsson? Or... Sure. Yeah. The mountain. Everybody knows him as the mountain. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, I'm gonna hope that my life's gonna get a little easier soon here. There you go. We're in. So now you're in the trade district, if you look at your objectives on the top left there. And we're gonna go and burn, burn some stuff. Oh, there's Springle. Yep. Oh, get it. Now I know, now I know what to watch for there. <laughs> that was a little bit of a rude, a rude awakening. Meanwhile, I'm sure there's stuff going on back here I'm not paying attention to, so what's happening down here? We're fighting over something. Yeah, a few guys coming in here or there. It's alright though. Uh, nice thing is you've got uh, lots of, of pop cap. Mongols start with like full pop cap, they don't have to population cap. You don't have to build uh, villages uh, to increase their population cap, uh, and uh, you've got a lot of money, so you can you can spend Start it to, to build your army and replenish your army as you go. Now, I want to replace that trebuchet that I kind of carelessly lost, um, and I'm noticing I can't actually build it from the siege workshop. I assume there's an upgrade somewhere I'm missing for that. Well, it could be a fourth age. It's a fourth age piece of equipment, but your siege workshop can produce the mangonels and springles. So I should really make sure I don't lose this last one. <laughs> Very careful with that one. I mean, there's other ways, right? You can you can certainly you can build rams, as Lauren said, you can build mangonels, which are a good um, kind of multi-purpose siege weapon. And you can see you've got stone there. You could build uh, two, at a, two at a time as well. That's your right. Siege workshop. I have not gotten a good sense on when to use a stone and when to save it yet because of how valuable it seems to be. I think the best time to spend it is when you have it. <laughs> don't, don't stockpile it. Well, let's finish taking this camp out so that we can at least have a little bit of rest with them. Wow, they're still... They love those, uh... They love those spring still, still building. Yeah, it was fun doing a lot of this, the civilization design and and, uh, and mechanics for these the different civilizations we we used. I think the, the Mongols and the Rus uh, were really fun because they they they're, they spent so many generations uh, engaged with each other. And they they really they really uh, a lot of of, of the their tactics and and uh, the design of their of their armies and and even some of their society you know elements of their society uh, of uh, rubbed off on each other in a lot of ways and so the Mongols were very mobile and obviously they're famous for their their cavalry and and uh, uh, and the Rus picked up a lot of those as well so they're they're a really interesting blend between east and west they have that kind of a lot of the mobility of the Mongols, uh, but then they've picked up some of the traits from 
from their engagement with the West, uh, you know, the, the castles and siege, and ultimately things like gunpowder uh, out of the out of their exposure to the to the to the West. And so there's there's kind of a you know when you look at all the civilizations in, in design and continuum, the way they actually all kind of relate to each other was informed a lot from the from the history and and the things that we discovered in in uh, working with our experts. The historical, I mean, this has kind of been a theme the whole way through, but the blend of that history and making a, a compelling game at the same time really comes together so well here. Mm. What am I missing that you, you're looking at and saying, hey, you really should be doing this and you're not doing this besides <laughs> paying a little better attention? Yeah, there's probably a couple more buildings down there in the south, yep. just to knock out that first yeah, district I think there. Probably, I mean, you got lots of resources, uh, so you're, you're pretty safe for a little while. Uh, a lot of, you know, times you... You want a pretty good blend of villagers just to give you that, uh, that flexibility and, and cushion the your resourcing. Yeah. And you can build a lot of uh, a lot of military. To the main city. Yeah, I should get more stuff pumping out there. I am. Uh, so with the Mongols, like you could certainly spend your stone to double up your unit production. Then the other option, when you say don't have stone, is you just build two or three barracks. Uh, two or three archery ranges, and you can produce multiple units out of multiple buildings as well, and that'll allow you to recover really, really quickly. If you if you lose a lot of your army, you just like you just start pumping out production from multiple buildings as well. I think this particular map has quite a lot of availability of resources on it. Yes, they do. Yeah, yeah this, this one's it's, it's and you very can rich. And, yeah. I think I'm a little overboard on resource collection right now, so I think I'm going to focus a little more on yeah. the fighting here for a little bit. Um, yeah. I have noticed how much of that it's stockpiled up, and I tend to be a little bit of a horror that way, so let's, um, let's just... Yeah, that's, uh, we call that float in the RTS world. You're floating <laughs> a lot of resources. And as you can tell, it's, I'm not uh, really being mindful about what I'm building. It's just more stuff for now. Uh, I'm sure that that is one of those areas where you get better over time at knowing what it is you need to do. Well, you know, there's, there's like, I don't know, we're working on Company Heroes 2, and, and something that Stalin had alleged to have said, which is that uh, quantity has a quality all its own. So if you can't, you know, if you uh, if you can't beat them with quality, just beat them with quantity. Well, let's try that here. We've got decent set of stuff here. I don't have my siege weapons here at the moment, but I guess I do have my trebuchet. But let's make sure we don't lose that before we really need it. Let me bring it down. We've got two more districts to take out here. Yep. Clear out some of this. Some of these units first. Pesky defenders. <laughs> A little over halfway through the show, I do want to take a moment and for those who are just joining us, uh, you're watching Game Pass Plays, uh, it's a show weekly here on the Xbox channel where we show off some of the new and great games that are in Game Pass and around the Xbox family. Today, super excited that it is Age of Empires 4 launch day and uh, I am both excited and proud to show off the game here and also a little embarrassed at level of skill at which I'm showing it off, but I think it's a you good see lesson. See the enemy up on the, up on the walls there, too. Sorry to jump in, but uh, you know, that's, that's uh, a mechanic that's new in, in Age of Empires 4 is the, uh, being able to use the walls. And as an attacker, by, you know, you take out the gate, you take out those defenders, you can use those walls. You get your guys up on there. Right now, I'm finding the malls more annoying than beneficial, but I will certainly keep that in mind. I, I do like calling out here that the work that the team has done at creating these different difficulty levels, right? This feels, you know, I wouldn't say it's, you know, a huge challenge insofar as I'm about to lose, but it's stressful enough with stuff going on. I feel like I am engaged and paying attention, but I don't feel like I am completely hopeless because I don't have the multitasking skills I once had, so I appreciate the scalability here too to your own skill level and, and the experience that you want to have. And that's the, you know, always a challenge in designing campaign missions is to make them engaging, um, not unwinnable. You know, you want you want the, the to be entertained, you want to have some fun encounters, but you want to make sure that uh, the players, most players can kind of get through without being frustrated or um, losing too often or having to restart that's uh it's always a, a challenge to to uh balance the difficulty across 
you know, hard and, and, uh, and normal and, and easy. And then, you know, the challenge at each of those levels. So it's a, it's a lot of, it ends up being a lot of work, a lot of iterative testing uh, with a lot of different kinds of players just to make sure you've, you've that sweet spot. It's a thing that we spend a lot of time talking about uh, in Xbox as a whole, this idea of gaming for everyone and wanting to make sure that we're making our games approachable for all gamers and not just, you know, your core folks or people who are, have high reflexes or anything else like that. Um, and one of those axes is what you're talking about, making sure that difficulty scales and that everyone can be successful and enjoy the game. Um, I do know from some of our internal talks before this came out that you guys have spent a lot of time trying to make this approachable in a lot of other ways too, right? The, the whole subject of civilizations and history and how we portray events in the world is, is something that can be delicate over time. And my understanding is that a whole lot of work went into figuring out how to do that in a respectful way. Is that something you guys could share a little more about? Yeah, um, right from the outset in this project, we were always very mindful to be respectful of the cultures that we're depicting here and to celebrate more depth of those cultures than we would maybe typically think of. You know, the military stuff is kind of like on the surface, the wars and battles and things. But underneath that, there were some very sophisticated civilizations here. The Mongols is a great example, you know. Historically, I guess, in the West, we've tended to think of this period of their history of being, you know, they're kind of sweeping across and indiscriminate slaughter and these, you know, bloodthirsty barbarians. But actually, there was a great deal of clever strategy going on and the rest of the civilization was, um, had a lot of sophistication to it. They were using technologies from the people from, you know, that they'd adopted from other people. And they had this rapid postal system we were talking about earlier. Um, they had religious freedom, they let people kind of, um, once they'd brought them under the empire, they could live their lives the way they were doing, so long as they paid their taxes. Um, and so we consulted with, I think it was a total of 46 different historical experts in different fields by the time we'd completed uh, the game, and that's, you know, people who were contributing to the historical aspect in the videos and the, the campaign videos, the ones that you unlock, the hands and history videos. Um, we had our art department were consulting on the, uh, you know, the architecture and on um, the design of armor and that kind of thing. So um, we've really gone deep on this and tried to bring to light some of those lesser known aspects of these cultures and celebrate them. I think those, the care's kind of evident there too, right? It, a lot of attention goes, and I've, I've seen a lot of reviews around this, around the gameplay and how carefully it's crafted here, but you can tell what the extra, the videos and the content and the narration and everything that is celebrated here, that you know, that's front and center thing. It's not a it's not a side effect or a side show. Yeah. Yeah, we, we found that, like, if you can bring some context, a little more context to, to a campaign, uh, the, the historical context and when this when this mission occurred and what the outcome was and how it connected to this, you know, particular piece of history and, you know, who might have been involved. It, it, uh, it, it's sort of a value add to the whole experience. So people, you know, enjoy the documentaries uh, because they provide background to the thing, you know, the mission they're about to play. Uh, and, and we were very careful to Kind of maintain this idea that the narrator was always talking about history. She she always talks about events that is Victoria, uh, about events that as they had occurred. You know, she's she, so she's your connection uh, from present to past, and, and sometimes it's a subtle thing, but I think it I think it works really well. It's a really fun way to, to think about objectives, and uh, you know, the narrative team did a great job writing. Uh, for for our narrator uh, and, so much and really bringing these things to life. So. Yeah, and we loved working with Victoria. She was such a pro. Yeah. Really great person to work with. She was originally uh, kind of our 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 test, right? It's like it's like mm. this. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll cast somebody to do some tests for us and see see if we like the approach. And we just ended up loving her style and her uh, her voice and, and what you know what she brought to the character of, of the narrator uh, and we ended up using her for you know from that point on for, for the whole game. Just, just I should all point fell out in love with her, her how she did it. 
Yeah, she's awesome. And I should point out that the game is fully localized into another eight languages as well, um, with full audio localization. Um, and then I think you can do subtitles in another six languages as well. Um, and some really wonderful narrators from all of those, uh, you know, they're native speakers, obviously, of those languages. In the meantime, it's it is cool. perfectly reasonable for any of you to point out that 13,000 wood is just not... <laughs> Not so necessary. Yeah. I could probably move some of those folks over. <laughs> Do you have some mangonels? They might be useful against those clumps of enemies in the city there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the other thing, I, I, I don't know if you've built a market yet. So one way oh, yeah. to, you know, take that wood and just sell it. Um, convert that wood to gold and then you can use that gold to buy food or other things at the market. Uh, and you can create traders as well uh, to trade with uh, some of the... Uh, the trading settlements and another way to gain resources so there's, there's lots of ways to build your economy in, in the game part of me says that's really cool i should do that and part of me says oh my gosh another thing to pay attention to <laughs> i was going to mention when we were talking about walls that if you wanted another plate to spin, uh, you can build uh siege towers in the field using your infantry and then load them up with some units and then unload those units on the wall um, right on the top of the wall if you wanted to um, control the wall before you've destroyed the gate. And it's funny that you mentioned that because um, one of the things the campaign does a really good job of uh, is introducing these concepts one at a time. I remember there was a previous mission on this that uh, was exactly about that and uh, I remembered to do it when that was the focus of things and now that there's so much stuff going on it's just <laughs> right out the other ear. So It's a little bit of an advanced tactic, yeah. How do you end up finding, given given how intricate this is and how many systems there are involved, how do you end up finding people who can fairly test whether stuff is balanced or not and, and <laughs> balance that against the skill level of the people who are involved? Well, I think we've, like, we've, we've got a very experienced, balanced team uh, internally to Relic, and we've worked a ton with the Gun Empires. Uh, team as well on uh, game and game balance and they, they did all of the uh, definitive edition games uh, so they're very they're very knowledgeable about about the franchise and about um, uh, about the Age of Empires games uh, and then you know we do a lot of work with the community and uh, you know once this game goes live like like to a degree all bets are off like we have to get it as close as we feel we can get um, but once it's out in the, you know, in the wild, so to speak, uh, you know, w there will be more games played today than we have probably played in the last year. Uh, and we'll find some things, and we'll we'll generate some some data, and we'll uh, we'll start looking at things that we need to uh, to address. You know, basically starting today. Like our our job isn't done. We're you know we've we've shipped today, and it's super exciting. But the there's a lot of, a lot of work, and, yeah, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be back at it, uh, uh, you know, there are teams working today. But you're, you are open to uh, gathering data of what's working and what's not and adjusting kind of the balance of things as, as things progress? Yeah, there's a, there's a mix oh, yeah. of, of data, using data and metrics, and, uh, and, and you know, there's still, there's still gut, right? There's still, data can't tell you everything. We, it informs your decisions, but we don't, we don't make them based on data alone. And that's something I just wanted to highlight, like we, as Quinn mentioned, we've been working with the community since almost the start of the project. Uh, it was 2017, I think. Right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, it was our community council that started with just 10 people, but it's expanded out to over 100 plus over the years of development. Um, but that also being said, like the balance team members, like they're all clocking over, like, they're in the thousands of hours played. Uh, but Quinn's right, like after today, maybe by tomorrow, like every, like the sheer amount of like, gameplay that's been done, it's just going to dwarf, um, the, the community's gameplay is going to just dwarf anything that we've done. All that data we're gonna get in the next few days, weeks, months, is just gonna help us inform, help us inform and make the game better. We've had, we've already had, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of hours of, of uh, uh, you know, viewership on, on Twitch, yeah. just in the even in the week leading up. Like, I don't even, I don't remember what the number is, but, but that's that's a lot of a lot of hours, a lot of engagement, a lot of people giving us feedback. So it's. It's uh, fantastic to see.
a while. I was just I wondering whether now might be a good time to move up your production building closer to the northern area of the city there. Oops, I think that's probably faster. right. Um, once I have a moment to think about it. The thing I was going <laughs> to ask in the meantime is, it looks like I'm not done in the trade district, but I'm not seeing anything. Uh, yeah, you've checked that one off through the check mark on the uh, Oh, there is. The I was looking at, yeah. Sorry, I was looking at yeah, the bar there, and I'm like, that doesn't look full. Oh, well, that was... That makes a lot Just checking sense. my hours in game to this point too, and I've got <laughs> 7,776 hours on wow. on, the, on Cardinal. Uh, so it's that's like a full time job. <laughs> it's almost as though it's your full time job. <laughs> it's almost as if it is your full time job. <laughs> I, I know Quinn, Quinn mentioned Cardinal. That's just that's just our in like in studio project name for the game. So he's excuse me, talking about Age Cards Four. Snay on the art, okay. No, it's okay. It's okay to say. Like, and the game's out now at this point. So, but that was just our internal project. Name. So, if you hear any dev say Cardinal, we we'll just refer to. It. It may come up. It's easy to refer to form because we we called it Cardinal for years and years, so we could uh, yep, exactly. uh, avoid letting it slip that we were working on on H four. Do you guys think about this in terms of like, hey, we've got a lot more work to do on this one for a while, or do you have your eyes on what's next? Any uh, any spoilers we can sneak out of you? <laughs> well, I mean, not like, I, yeah, I, I, and that's part of the reason why I'm here is to make sure that we don't spill <laughs> too many of the beans. But, but is, is there uh, a delay on the broadcast? Really? You're like, like, how, do you, yeah, how, do you, how would you stop us? And, and Lord. <laughs> Uh, but we are releasing a cool behind-the-scenes look later this afternoon. I will tease that. So um, if you guys want to check that out on Age of Empires channel, a bit of a plug. But uh, we've got a cool video that's going to be coming out just kind of uh, showcasing something. So I'll just mention that. Um, but yeah, definitely like we've been like looking ahead for sure of like, the work that is coming ahead of us. Like, obviously, the biggest priority for us is to make sure that we... Um, are around to, to get address, address balance, um, any kind of issues that crop up with, as, as you can imagine, any game that launches. Um, as Quinn mentioned, even the fact that like just today alone will probably dwarf, the sheer amount of hours played today will probably dwarf the entire development team's like, hours played. And like, and I'm, this is talking like thousands of hours from the balance team, hundreds and if not thousands from like people like Quinn and our designers. Um, I have like, I think I have like about 400 hours on my end, like it's just, but you know that's been over the years of development. So like just getting this year amount of data and getting sent to reports, all this stuff's just going to help us inform. You know, honestly, it's better. So, uh, but questions. I think today we're going to try to today we're going to try to enjoy the launch a little bit before we get well right back. well earned, right? right Absolutely. <laughs> a couple of questions I am finally noticing in chat. Um, one question is if you can share. Do you happen to know who the composer is for for this game? Uh, yeah, there's been, uh, so we worked with a lot of different composers. Um, our music lead is Liv Gardner. Um, she worked with a team of composers. Um, I don't have the names off the top of my head, um, but uh, one of them is uh, Tillman. I uh, don't cannot pronounce the last name, so I wouldn't even try, but he's with a studio group from Diana Medion um, in Germany. And another one that some people may re recognize, uh, Mikolai uh, Stransky, I want to say is his last name. I might have butchered that. Um, apologies if I did, but he uh, he's done some previous work with uh, some stuff like Warrior, and obviously now uh, Age of Empires IV. So uh, a lot of like it was a very global approach to working with a lot of people to try to capture each Civ's unique soundscape. Same with voice acting, same with research, kind of across the board. Yep. Just so much care put into yep. into the global. Yeah, and I mentioned earlier. Really, yeah, exactly. I mentioned earlier that like we went to Mongolia to do a voice like, capture for the Mongolian Civ. Like, like it was just like it, it was a very truly global effort to uh, make this game what it is, and, and to make sure that you know we're properly representing what uh, what what happened in the past, right? Like our game is rooted in history for a reason. Go back to music for a moment. Um, <clears throat> the soundtrack to this game is absolutely beautiful. I had the privilege of being a to help with naming the. Um, the track names for the official soundtrack and i spent you know a couple of days just listening to these incredibly beautifully composed scores um and you know thinking about the history and what would be appropriate names here and uh the team have really really put together something wonderful there 
it's one of those things that I've noticed that it, you know, it blends in and doesn't distract you if you're really focused on it, but as soon as you kind of have a peaceful moment and think, it's so rich and evocative. I really do appreciate it. Mm. And it and it changes as you age up too. It starts out more peaceful and then gets more dramatic as you go up through the ages. You know, they they all have um, you know unique period instruments uh, in, uh, you know used, uh, and every every uh, civilization has its own soundtrack. Uh, you know they were built off of themes that we sort of established for the, for the civilizations and themes for their ages. Sort of the very early creative visions, uh, you know, and, and uh, Lynn had taken those and uh, built a whole plan around the music and, and how to deliver it. Uh, it's, it's super fascinating. Finally taking Lauren's advice here to uh, move here when I have a spare move second. On up. Someone I don't all... know if you noticed, you missed a couple of buildings on the west side of the district. Yeah, there you go. One, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Looks like there's probably one or two little enemy structures down and around your uh, your earlier base mm -hmm. there. They're sending one or two guys here and there, but... Yeah. Oh, enough to, to mop up here. Um, another question from chat. Is there some way, uh, do you give, get some kind of extra tracking of what difficulty levels you have beat different campaign missions on, or is it all kind of the same? Is there any way that you get... Uh, oh, cool. Is there like some way to track on your campaign? Well, do you, is there some way to say, hey, I beat this level on hard versus I beat it on normal versus I beat it on easy? Yeah, I, I, there's a number of achievements and things that can be unlocked um, and, and sort of special rewards um, that are unlocked for, for completion of certain campaign events. And I, I'm pretty sure certain things on, on difficulties. I don't, don't quote me on that, but... Uh, but uh, achievements and your your sort of your visual memorials that you can add to your town centers uh, reward uh, uh, you know certain certain play in in the campaign and in skirmish and the art of war and, and all the other ways of playing the game. So yeah, there's a whole feature called masteries, um, which is like a series of little tasks that you can do using each civilization to get certain kinds of rewards. There's some unlockable history pieces and some things for your, like, your avatar and your profile and stuff like that. Um, and some of those are based on difficulty level, like, you know, win a skirmish on hard against this AI and, and things like that. Um, not sure about campaign, to put it on the list for the future. Someone else asking about visibility of waypoints on the minimap, which uh, I'm not even sure I know how to set a waypoint thing, yet, so... Yeah, things like your rally points or shift queuing up movements and things. Um, yeah, there, I mean, there's a lot of things that we have uh, on our on our list. You know, I think people uh, hopefully are not surprised that you know, when you build a game, there are things that, uh, you know, you, you want to keep working on, and, and this is no exception. We, you know, we talk about this game as the... Kind of the, the beginning of the conversation with the community. It's you know it's uh, it's like at, at this point we'd love your feedback. Help us prioritize what we work on next, and uh, and we'll keep um, uh, building to support the the uh, the title. Um, you know, I mean these games go for years and years and years, right? Like like uh, some of our games, multiple years later, we're still doing patches and add upgrades and bug fixes and things. So I feel like I also um I gotta ask. This whole idea of being able to move your base is is great. How on earth are you supposed to do this when you're battling someone who's actually pressuring you more than easy? Because I just can't even conceive of how to keep all that going uh, with everything else you need to pay attention to. That's that's the age-old challenge. I know what you know. I often will move some of these with my army, uh, and so I'm doing I'm doing kind of double duty. It's like I'm going to go here and take your stuff, and then my buildings are going to go and plop you know plop down, and I'm gonna I'm gonna really take your stuff. And that's that. So I you know there's yeah, you kind of kill two birds with one with one stone in many cases, uh, where you can kind of take over an expansion or, or, or seize an area of resources and then you've got the army there and the buildings with, you know, to exploit it as well. Okay, well that's I tend to leave better. my, um, just to weigh in on that, I tend to leave my um, economy buildings where they were, like the town center and the Gers, and I leave the villages alone in their little corner of the world and then just break the military buildings with me so I can produce without putting my villages in danger. 
No, it makes sense. I think we're kind of committed at this point, so. Yeah. <laughs> So this is uh, still going, though. <laughs> a, a case where, like, like using some of your your uh, heavy infantry and your spearmen, uh, and clearing those walls uh, would be uh, you can get the art. Like horses can't go up on the walls, but your infantry can. My so current, current thought was just, well, I'll just let the trebuchet destroy those walls, and that'll work too. Uh, and mangonels also are really good in this instance because they'll, you know, those guys are firing crossbows, so they're going to really decimate your heavily armored units. You guys need to stop rushing in there because it's not going to go well for you. <laughs> uh, if you want, you can use the stand ground uh, on the... on the... Uh, oh, there we go. That yeah. man card there. So that'll keep those units. They won't move. Alright, so what we're going to do is we're going to set up not right against that wall and we're going to get our siege workshop back up and build some of the mangonels you're talking about. the advice and the patience here and I would like for everyone to realize that hey if I can make my way through this this should be good sign to all of you that you can make your way through this as well so if you haven't started downloading yet there's something here for yeah everyone. and that, that's something level. that we you know we talked about earlier uh, the difficulty scaling difficulties right like we're playing right now in easy mode uh, there is a story intermediate and hard um, I know, as Quinn mentioned, like he plays on hard difficulty. Like I switch between intermediate and hard, uh, depending on how much, you know, how much of uh, a challenge I want to face. But um, this game really is been designed from the from the ground up to make sure that we are able to accommodate, you know, anybody who is interested in jumping in to play Age of Empires 4. And uh, I know that we're on uh, the Xbox channel, so it's good to mention that this is available today, day one, launch day on Xbox Game Pass for PC. Uh, you can get on there and it is going to be right there and available for you to try and play. So uh, you're on the fence and you have Game Pass, great way to check it out. Well, so to your point here, um, kind of in chat, Everak is asking, is there a big learning curve here for somebody who has played Halo Wars and Civilization before but hasn't done an RTS or an Age of Empires? Um, I just I I saw that it's... comment too. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah. yeah. Do you want to answer that, Quinn, or do you want me to? Uh, yeah, I mean, I I think if you've played Halo Wars, you've uh, you've done a lot of what uh, what's needed to uh, you know to understand real time strategy games. And I mean, Age of Empires start out life as a real time version of Civilization. That that was you know one of the big inspirations uh, for Ensemble and, and uh, one of the things they talked about uh, with the and building Age of Empires, uh, very first time. So the, you know those games have a lot of uh, a lot of systems and a lot of interplay between game mechanics, and then you have the real time aspect from from Halo Wars, and you could totally jump in and play Age of Empires. Uh, I'm gonna hope that I've got the right units at this point to see if we can get this polished off in the time we've got here. One more district to go there, and then you're all done. It's gonna look like I timed this intentionally. <laughs> I did. Sure it might, be, I did. might be time to unleash hell, as they say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see. It's a lot of units. Let's see if we have any problems here. But I'm gonna guess on easy that we'll make some short work of stuff here. You see, the the rust just sent out a warrior monk. That's one of their unique units, uh, and it can actually uh, buff. But, you know the the combat units around them. They're sort of inspirational units. So when they're in combat, everybody else around them fights more uh, vigorously. Sort of Saint's blessing all my, idea. Uh, similar to all my guys are glowing gold right now. I use the uh, yes, fire use speed increase bonus. there to make this go a little bit more quickly. While I, and I, I realize that I'm jinxing it here, but while I kind of mop up here as we kind of get to the last minutes of our stream, any, uh, any last thoughts you'd like to leave folks with? Any inspirational um, thoughts about the game or little tidbits that you want them to know about as they're starting their age 4 journey themselves? I, I, I think, um, you know, I mean, we, we obviously we, we built the game for, uh, for the community. Uh, and 
with a lot of a lot of inspiration from the stories we heard and the importance that uh, gaming and, and this game in particular can have on on people's lives. Uh, and we uh, we love building it. We're we're hoping uh, get a chance to, to check it out. Uh, if it lives up to your your expectations. We know it's an amazing franchise. And, it was a little bit intimidating to, uh, to, you know, to to think about making this game, uh, just because of the legacy. But uh, we're all really happy and, and proud of what we've done, and, and uh, you know, the, basically, the, it, you know, it all starts. It all sort of starts for us today. We've, we've closed one chapter on Age of Empires, uh, but with launching, but there's there's you know still a lot of the book left uh, to write and. Uh, Hoping you, uh, you come along for it. Hi, I got. I also just want to say, like, uh, uh, I'm just gonna oh. interject and say you guys have more than done the legacy proud here. I think it's uh, clear to everyone to see. So, sorry about that. Go ahead. No, no. I just want to say that, like, uh, the game was made so that, like, there's a low entry barrier, but there's a lot of like, like the sky's the limit on how much. You can um, there's basically, a, you know, I think the way, you know, Quinn, I think you framed it was like easy to grasp but like more like difficult to master is kind of the phrasing that we said but like that being said like campaign's a great way to get in um, i spent a lot of time in my formative years playing with my friends co-op versus ai and that's something that we have here there's also a range of difficulties we have four different ai difficulties um, that you can then start to uh, ramp up and take on and challenge as you get more of the game and then obviously uh, getting into multiplayer is uh, if you really want to test your metal great way to do so um, but yeah like this game was made so that anybody can pick up and play but if you really do spend some time with it you know it's going to be an amazing journey to master yeah and i'm going to add this more from the sort of narrative and historical perspective so i'm just really excited for everyone to just experience these stories and the richness of these cultures that we're depicting um i was saying the other day that this is the sort of thing that as uh, this is a really parent-mom thing to say, but um, I'm really looking forward to showing this to my kids and having them be as fascinated by some of this history as I have been learning about it during the course of development. And, um, you know, I, I, unfortunately, when I was at school, my history teachers, well, you know, classes were a little dry, and I kind of thought of history as the thing that kind of existed as words in a dusty old book, you know? It didn't really mean that much to me, but since I've been learning about how the events, oh, you did it, yay! The events of the past are actually connected to today. It's been really enlightening. The Mongol and I hope other people have been experienced. I saw some folks in chat already That's saying falling. that this is a more fun history lesson than uh, they got in school here. But <laughs> there you go. Monka Khan and his Mongol no, warriors. Not not the Age of Empires. Age of Empires has been teaching history Cutting since 1997. So, you know, yeah, it only makes sense that we continue the legacy, right? We've been hearing that people became interested in history because of playing this game, and, and you know, we definitely want to continue, continue that legacy. Into the West. I think it was a Reddit post or something that somebody had shared at work here about, uh, you know, if, if this game had come out in 1998 or, or not, well, not 1998, but some date, I, I would have switched my major to history. <laughs> <laughs> and I got to say, yeah. I know a lot of folks, uh, you know, tend to be serious multiplayer strategy players. They jump straight into the multiplayer. Besides teaching the mechanics, the campaign itself, just the history elements and what you learn there and also just the the level of craftsmanship around the the storytelling and the narrative and the videos and uh, all the music and everything um, it's something that's really worth worth jumping into even if you're you're itching to get into multiplayer so um, just all do we around have time? sorry do we have time to watch the yam video that you unlocked there we it just explains do. a little bit more about what quinn was saying earlier yeah i will click that up in just a second i want to kind of get this question here or maybe this is a, a feature suggestion more but uh Chillock wondering if if selecting your own hotkeys is something that that they might see down the down the line yeah i mean there's a bunch of things that uh, that we're working on and in, in in um you know like i said people getting back to work today and tomorrow on on aspects of the game and uh feedback that we had received in in the past uh, and and things like fully remappable keys, um, uh, key binding schemas, and those kinds of things are, are something we're we're uh, we're looking at for we're looking for at future yeah, releases. Sure. Yeah, and there, you know, I think we're um, we're going to uh, kind of present a roadmap of what we want to do uh, 
um, maybe in November, uh, some some kind of time frame, just talking about the plans for the games in the next, you know, few weeks and 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 uh, and period following on. Uh, so so stay tuned. Yeah, that's basically what I was gonna say. Um, like we we're like I said, we are keeping an eye on all the chatter and all the stuff, and we'll continue to do so for the weeks and months and years ahead. So um, definitely, if there is something you want, like spin up a topic on whether social media, Reddit, forums, um, we're keeping an eye and uh, we will have an update soon to the community. Um, just kind of like, as Quinn mentioned, a roadmap of sorts. Um, but, uh, you know, until then, like jump in the game, play it, and then give us your feedback. Give us, uh, you know, your thoughts and like all this stuff is going to help us just make the game and shape the game to be better. Love hearing all the stories from people in chat who have been with this series for, for 20 plus years at this point as well. Um, Hey, we're going to go ahead and close the show with this CM video. So take a moment here real quick and say thanks, everyone, for watching. Thank you, uh, Elliot, Quinn, Lauren, so much for being with us. I know that it is a big week for you. Uh, finally, the culmination of these these five years of work here and just incredible game you guys have crafted here and put out. And I hope that you are as proud as, uh, as I am excited. And I think all of our viewers are excited to play it. So thank you for taking some of your time this busy launch week to, to share your experience with us and to, uh, to help us help us meddle through this campaign. Yeah. Well, thanks, thanks Nick. For having yeah. Us. Yeah. Thanks it's been a real, it's been a real pleasure. Yeah. And we will uh, take you all out with this, this video on the yam here, and we will see you all next week. Uh, one o'clock, Thursday for another episode of Game Pass Plays. There is also more Age of Empires and more Xbox content throughout the week. I was so. going to say, Nick, can we just plug in like yeah. where they can get the game and play? So Absolutely. Uh, Age of Empires 4 launched today, this morning at 8 a.m. Pacific. It is available uh, obviously on Xbox Game Pass for PC, uh, as well as the Microsoft Store and Steam. So if you want to check it out and have Xbox Game Pass, uh, hop onto the Xbox Hub and give it a whirl. Otherwise, you know, you can get the game on the Microsoft Store or Steam. Wherever you get the game, they can all play together. Exactly, yeah. There's cross play across all those three. Awesome. Thanks again, and uh, enjoy the video. The vast Mongol Empire was created by warfare, but it was governed by bureaucracy. Good communications across the empire were vital, and that was the job of the Yam Riders. The Yam was an incredibly well-organized postal system, introduced by Genghis Khan over 800 years ago. It consisted of a network of relay stations, linked by high-speed riders. These riders were so fast, they were known as the arrow messengers. You know, they rode at such a bruising pace that they would have to use these cloths to support their abdomen, their spine, and their internal organs. Yam messengers wore a sash of bells, so they could be heard approaching from a distance. With this advance warning, a fresh relay horse could be ready as soon as they arrived. Remounting like this allows us to travel several relays each day. With a constant stream of riders, Official messages could be carried quickly to and from all corners of the empire. In China alone, the Yam had over 14,000 relay depots and over 50,000 horses. In some areas, the relay stations were much closer together. Here, the system also used fast runners. However, it was the hard-riding couriers that made the YAM such a rapid communications web. And to ensure it ran smoothly, riders carried a medallion, the Paisa. Paisas acted as passports and gave the owner authority to demand goods and services from the YAM stations and the local population. The YAM messengers were the lifeblood that flowed through the great Mongol Empire.